So we're here in the uh, demo corner of uh, San Levenov. Um, we study at the Gerrit Rietveld Academy, uh, where he gradu uh, where he graduated last week. Was it last week? Yes. And be but before that, he also uh, went to the Free University, where he got a degree in computer science. Uh, knowing enough about the endless opportunities to uh, control things precisely, in his artwork he tries to explore the opposite. So, um, the, the um, uncertainty, indirect models, uh, and one of the examples of that is, uh, is what you see here, the publicity plant. I would like to invite Sandra to explain us a little bit about it. Okay, thank you. Um, well, what you're looking at here is a um, improvised greenhouse. It is a, a project that has been running since uh, March until um, the 1st of Ju July last week when I graduated at the uh, Gerrit Rietveld Academy. Um, inside was a, uh, was a plant and it was a uh, graduation uh, bouquet. And um, I was growing the bouquet in a very uh, complex way in this greenhouse for um, reasons of uh, publicity. I mean, if you're an art student and you're coming to this art world, it's very busy, nobody notices you, so you have to think of something to get noticed. And then there is a phenomenon that um, is named publicity plant, that is something that is created just for the sake of publicity, nothing more. So I thought, okay, I need a publicity plant, and that's what I um, created. And I created a very literal um, publicity plant. This is actually a plant and it's actually living off publicity because this greenhouse is uh, controlled by a computer that's standing over there. There's some, some hardware connecting the two and the computer is constantly scanning the entire internet for publicity about me or about the project. So I will give an example now. There's a computer here and there's uh, Twitter, which is a very popular medium of today. And if I now just Twitter about this publicity plant. Let's say publicity plant. Update. And now we have to be a little bit patient because the... Oh, well, that goes quick. <laughs> um, so the computer was, was monitoring Twitter, it was checking Flickr, it was doing delicious bookmarks, it was doing anything. It was even uh, responsive to Google searches. So when somebody was Googling on my name or on the project, the, um, yeah, the lamp in the greenhouse was on. And so the bouquet was giving light and so it was growing. And in the end the, the plant was, the bouquet was visualizing how much publicity I had. So how much successful the graduation was actually, because it's really what counts. And the other good thing about the project was that I had a very legitimate uh, reason to just send an email to almost anybody saying, okay, I need some support for this, uh, this plant, it will die. And it was not really spam because actually the publicity was just all I was asking for. It was an integrated part of the project. And um, yeah, I, I um, I didn't ask people to press a button to let it grow, I just, um, and I also did not ask them to do nothing, uh, I did something in between, I asked them to do, um, to make a reference to the project, which is a very contemporary thing, I think, to not really um, study the things you see, but just refer to it on Twitter or on, on your blog on on anything. Well, this is actually a, a demonstration plant that's there now, the real plant, the, the real bouquet was this one. There's um, a picture um, of the situation on the 1st of July and it's looking horrible. It's, uh, it looks like a disaster, but um, in the week before the graduation I went to the um, plant doctor in the Hortus Botanicus and uh, luckily the, um, the doctor informed me that actually it's the plant to blame for the failure because um, the plants are really not capable of handling the 24 hours economy that we live in today. Like people from all over the world twittering at any moment of the day, uh, turning on and off the lights continuously. So the plant was actually really ruined and it, it, yeah, the, the plant doctor didn't really like the confrontation with the plant actually. He said, well, it's, it's going nowhere, no more flowers, nothing. So that's what I take. Um, for the next project I will do with plants that I should treat them more like a human and with a little more respect. 
Thank you. And oh, by the way, the machine is uh, open um, for the rest of the night, so you can just Google or Twitter. And there's also uh, I created a WordPress blog, so you can just write and see the light turn light turn on. Thank you. I have to say that the the actual bouquet is still making me sad. When I saw it in your uh, exhibition, uh, your final show, uh, I was also kind of disappointed, I have to say, but I'm happy that the doctor explained that it was the planned, yes. not the publicity campaign. Um, be before uh, I break it open to the audience, uh, I, I already from the, from the first instant I, I saw your project, I had the feeling that it actually had a lot to do with how responsible people felt for the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, now with, with plants, I can imagine that people say, it's a plant, right? So I'm not gonna Twitter about it all day just to make sure that this plant survives. But have you thought about the same concept, but then with animals or human beings? Uh, yes, of course I've thought about it. And um, those things are, are possible, but I think that this also shows that actually when you need to do it well and you just give control to the audience, they should, uh, yeah, they should get together and really control it well. Um, with this plant, it really didn't matter um, that it was harmed, and it was actually just a publicity plant, and I think everybody knew that. But I would find it a bit difficult to, to really force people to um, be involved, because else an animal will die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, think, I think it would be very cool to do that. I was just thinking whether people would feel more responsible for the project and also visit it. I, I bet you would make more publicity from taking an animal, though. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I guess so, yeah. Are there yeah, any questions from the audience here on the project? Should you be you, not inside the... Me? <laughs> Should you want to wear own food and yourself yeah. inside? Okay, so I, maybe I skip the animal step and I just go in there myself next time. Yeah. Next graduation. Well, maybe you, in a way you already did, or did you uh, have some sort of empathy with, with the plant already? Oh, um, yes, very much. And in a way, I was very much involved because it was standing um, in my hallway. So every time I came home, um, this was there and it, it was either completely dark and the plant was standing in the dark or there was light and somebody just Googled or, or wrote something about it. So I was definitely feeling, um, yeah, something for the plant. And the watering I did myself, just, um, yeah, I didn't automate that as well. Okay, and I sense there's also a, a statement in this project on maybe Twitterers and bloggers, people who are doing it? Are you suggesting they are vegetables? No, they're, they're, they're well, they, they maybe react as vegetables. Uh, yeah, could because be. it they, is something they match. That yeah. a lot of people are checking their web statistics and they are very happy if there are a lot yeah. of visitors. Yeah, so it's, it's actually a, a natural web statistics for, yeah, visualization for me. Um, that's true. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, oh. And now, who is more famous, the plant or you? I think it's it's the plant. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that changes now that I'm here, sort of. Are you also considering uh, other, well, implementations of digital technology in combination with uh, biological entities, plants, because um, they are well, they are very sensible and. Uh, Maybe there are other options. Did you yeah. consider that, or are you well, considering uh, that? I think it, it could be possible to do some some feedback loops to to really listen to the plant and use that to um, control the plant. And in the end, I will not be even needed anymore. I mean, the plant can do that all uh, by himself. But then you get to sort of research levels that are really complicated. And I think there will be many people exploring that. But it might be good to cooperate cooperate with those um, yeah those kind of technicians one day. Okay, then thank you, Sander. An applause, please. <laughs> and if, uh, if someone could give the, uh, the plant some more publicity because it ran out of light yeah. during the interview. Well, thanks. <laughs> then we'll continue to the uh, next presentation or demonstration, uh, which is uh, likely to be the most dangerous presentation of the evening. <laughs> uh, it's by Thomas Twait, who studied microeconomics, biology, and geography before joining the Design Interactions Program at the Royal College of Art. Uh, his graduation project is called the uh, Toaster Project, 
And it's an ambitious challenge to create a typical mass-produced object, but by hand. Uh, what is regarded as one of the simplest uh, pieces of household equipment might turn out to be not so simple to recreate by hand. And I think the toaster uh, is a perfect example of that. Thomas? Uh, <coughs> hello. Um, yeah. Um, about nine months ago, um, I thought I would um, try and make a toaster, um, but really make a toaster starting from the very beginning. Um, so starting by digging up the raw materials from the ground. Um, and uh, as my model, um, I decided to kind of reverse engineer a, um, you know, the cheapest toaster I could find, which um, in Britain was uh, happened to be three pounds ninety four um the argos value two slice white toaster and um and I was opening it up and I was kind of very shocked to discover that you know if you start taking apart even go right down and start taking apart the capacitors and um stuff like that then there's kind of four hundred odd bits inside a a thing which you can buy for three pounds. Uh, 94 um, and you know when it came to the materials that those bits were made from uh, you know I kind of you know you can't even really tell the difference between some materials but you kind of know they're different and um, and so you know I estimated that you know there would be about a hundred materials um, and as I was kind of funding my toaster by myself and you know lived in Britain I decided that I would cut that down to um to five materials that I could that I thought I would be able to do um and so <coughs> I started off uh by trying to make steel because I thought that's you know the metal bits inside a toaster the kind of framework and stuff is from steel and um and so I went to a you know steel comes from iron so I you know searched around for an iron mine and there's one called Clearwell Caves in the southwest of England and I phoned them up and said, uh, you know, I'm trying to build a toaster. Can I come up and, um, you know, have some iron ore? And the guy on the end of the phone, um, who you'll see in a second, uh, yeah, was like, oh yeah, sure, no, no problem. But when I got there, um, it turns out that he'd heard, you know, misheard what I was saying on the phone and thought I was coming up because I was wanting to make a poster. And so he was expecting me to just you know, want to take a photograph, but I was, where's the pickaxe and stuff? But um, anyway, I'll show you uh, a bit of him. Uh. Maybe. Is it going? Oh. Uh. Limestone wheel okay, so anyway, the um, oh god, the quality is not very good. Um, anyway, the sound that was isn't that important. Um, by, uh, the thing was, is, is of course, there aren't any uh, mines that are you know, certainly ago. metal mines in the UK, um, so it was kind nice of a, warm, a sunny it used to be a mine, but it was, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And suddenly, something this is Ray on the end of the phone, destroyed all that, who used nice to be a miner at this place and produced a very murky sea. There's something that's up there. How much do you think that weighs? Like, I mean, well, what do you think, you know, given that we've never done it before? Be enough to make a teaspoon, I A teaspoon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is just stuff we've thrown into the... Right. Yeah. Uh, we turned down the sound a bit. So then I had this, um, basically this suitcase, I took it back on the train in the suitcase, so I had a suitcase full of rock, and the question was, what do I do with it? Um, so I ended up doing a bit of research, and um, kind of building a modern day version of the furnace, uh, you know, which was, you know, they used to use, you know, kind of way back before, um, you know, books existed so that was my suitcase of iron ore is
um, but instead of a bellows, I am a set of bellows. I had a, a leaf blower. I started off with hair dryers, but the hair dryers have a safety cutout uh, when they get too hot, which they quickly did. Um, so. So this is kind of after quite a long day um, and we've got this kind of lump of black stuff out the bottom and uh, it was kind of a slightly odd situation because you didn't, couldn't, didn't even know if it was metal or not, you know, had it worked, had it not worked, you know, it was kind of magnetic and it sort of tasted like metal but, um, you know, but actually, yeah, good. Um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, it wasn't metal, um, or it was sort of metal. Uh, um, it hadn't quite kind of been refined fully, so I ended up finishing it off um, in a microwave, um, which, you know, there's a photo there, but um, that's another s kind of part of it. Um, so the microwave did actually work, so I got, a, you know, blobs of iron about this big. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, it was a kind of a partial success, really. Um, and then the next material that I was after was mica, which is um, the kind of grey sheet around which the um, element is wrapped in a toaster. It's kind of like an electrical insulator um, and a uh, sort of thermal insulator. And this is getting the mica. Um, and we went to this really beautiful place in Scotland, actually, um, to look for this special mineral uh, and it's kind of cool it just kind of flakes off the side of a rock it comes in sheets and it just flakes off the side uh, okay good um, and then I needed copper which you can see here uh, for the wires and the pins of the electrical plug. Um, and that came from a mine in Wales. Um, I'll just go through that. It's quite, uh, yeah. Um, and actually, um, this was used to be like the largest copper mine in the world at one stage, but obviously um, it's not working now because it can't compete with the kind of the scale on which, you know, metal is mined um, in Australia or South America and I was actually getting water contaminated with copper because um, you know it's easier to extract the copper from the you know water than kind of smelt it that was this weird kind of fungus thing um, and then plastic uh, of course I needed plastic for the plastic case um, <laughs> uh, and so that was obviously quite a difficult one because um, you know, we've had metals for kind of thousands of years, but the plastic age kind of only started, um, you know, in the last hundred years. But um, plastic comes from oil, so I started by phoning up BP and um, spent a good kind of 45 minutes trying to convince the PR guy at BP that it would be fantastic if they kind of flew me to an oil rig and let me have a jug of oil. Um, and I think he was almost going to do it, but sort of ended by saying that, um, you know, uh, ended by saying uh, that it would be easier for them if they, um, you know, if I needed a tanker full kind of thing. So um, I sort of, you know, was the degree show was approaching and uh, time was getting short. So um, I uh, decided that as we're in a new geological age, uh, the Anthropocene, um, because you know geologists of the future would detect a, a shift in the uh, in the strata of rock suddenly it would become a bit radioactive and there'd be kind of these new synthetic molecules floating around that I could go and mine some plastic um, and there's a convenient fly tip just round the corner from my house and um, so I just went there and kind of got an old baby's toy and an old um, and an old uh, plastic tub and uh, this was carving the mould because um, I needed like an injection moulding machine and uh, 
This is just melting down the plastic. Um, so, da da, right. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, one material that I haven't been able to get yet is rubber, um, which I would use to insulate the electrical wires. Uh, I phoned up Kew Gardens, which is a botanic gardens in, um, in Britain, and said, Oh, can I come and tap your rubber tree? But they said, If you come and damage our tree, <laughs> we'll. Um, We'll put you in jail or whatever. So um, I'm actually going to try and toast some bread, and this is the first time it's been plugged into the mains. Um, so I spent all day earthing it. Uh, uh, I'm not in sure. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, all right. Dot said he'd kick me away if anything happened. So thanks, Dot. Uh, so it's either going to get very hot very quickly or not work or something. So, right, okay, let's, I haven't turned it on yet, <laughs> so I'll put this in the taster, and that goes in there, all right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Let there be a warning to everyone yeah. around. Yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah, don't touch those because they're going to have current going through them. Uh, okay. Um, I'm still slightly concerned, but right. I'll just turn it all over here. Oh shit! Oh god! Well, it worked for a second. <laughs> uh, let's see if there's any sign of taste. Okay, it didn't work. All right, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I survived. I'm still alive. That's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me unplug it just to make sure. Um, so... Uh, okay, uh, while we see what the damage is... Uh, we could maybe start start the Q and A. <laughs> this is the first question. <laughs> is it damaged? I think the element probably just sort of fizzed out. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so that's the inside. Uh, oh yeah, look, you can see the element burnt through. Bugger. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh God, that's quite a lot more work on the wire making machine in the jewellery department. It happens with the best goldsmiths. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I would like to say that I've. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> that well, I think it's a wonderful project because you don't think about it. We have so many products around us in our world and you just don't think about where they come from. And, well, often they are made in China or something, but not, not in the neighborhood. And it's wonderful to see that it is possible to make a do-it-yourself toaster, except yeah. that yeah, well, <laughs> you still have to eat the bread. But I, I, st I still think the, your attempt is... Uh, is very uh, very good. <laughs> so I'm 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 confident that after the culture class there will will still be uh, toast. 
exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if we're all yeah. toast, we still yeah. have toast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I'm not sure if we will still have ele electricity uh, then, but yeah, that's something. Start that with the toaster yeah. and work backwards. Yeah, you uh, re-engineer power backwards. Power yeah. Power yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, is, uh, I s yeah, I saw your. Oh, now it's gone. I saw your iPhone there. I thought oh, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. that's the next thing you're working oh, on. But on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I showed it to Jonathan Ive actually, and he said he really he liked it. So, you know. Is there another product that you would want to work on? Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, actually there's like a famous economics essay, um, which. I found out about kind of once I'd started doing this thing and it describes all the steps necessary to make a pencil and it's um, it's called I pencil and it's written from the um, perspective of a pencil and uh, and so I suppose it would be quite interesting to make a pencil um, you know graphite wood paint God knows what else um, you know I think like, it's probably interesting to try and make lots and lots of things actually um, shoes anything <laughs> I actually when I first saw your project I was I was thinking back to where we kind of lost the ability to make the stuff that we were using uh, have you been thinking about that and did you find an answer yeah I mean I think um, I actually kind of started the project as a sort of reaction to um, what I kind of saw as quite an unhelpful idea um, that to kind of confront the sort of crisis of economics plus um, you know the environment uh, that you know we need to kind of retreat to a sort of self-sufficient way of life and um, and I kind of wanted to investigate basically what that means um, and obviously taking it to an absurd sort of degree um, but you know this is you, you know I don't think we have been able to kind of be act as a single person for, you know, nearly since we became, um, you know, human beings. I mean, the whole point of being a human is, you know, you're kind of just talking and working with kind of loads of other people. So even like in medieval times, there was still, you know, yeah. trade and everything. But, but I was thinking even before that, when life was still simple, and you had a spear and a, <laughs> and yeah. a stick to make fire, yeah. fire with. Yeah. Like yeah. Where, where, where did we go wrong, basically? I, I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know if we have, you know, I mean, I'm still kind of quite, you know, I think it's, you know, it's given me like a newfound respect for the value toaster and, you know, and I think it is, you know, it's quite amazing that you can get something so complex for like nothing. But then, of course, I think we pay, at the moment, much too little because, you know, there's so much work that goes into it and so much kind of smoke that goes up just to make a toaster, but we don't pay for kind of about half of that. So. Uh, and which part of the process was actually the most difficult to realise? Uh, I think, you know, the, the iron, definitely. I mean, um, I suppose in that kind of, yeah... You know, it start, started with the Bronze Age, so that was copper, and then kind of eventually got to the Iron Age. And then, you know, I was trying to make steel initially, and, you know, I was thinking, okay, I'll make a steel spring to pop up the toast. That was my plan, but I couldn't make a spring, you know, because I just couldn't, uh, you know, it, iron was hard enough. Caesar? Sorry. Um, I just thought about this because you're presenting it out of the UK for the first time, I think, and... Uh, um, UK is known for being the country of industrial revolution, and uh, now there's a trend of speaking about personal fabrication and this kind of thing. And um, do you think it's reality, personal fabrication? And <laughs> do you think, do you know what I mean? Or uh, is this, is, is this a comment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think what you mean, fab at home and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, in that's kind of in the distance, you know, like. Obviously, that has got to overcome not only the technological sort of um, obstacle, but also the kind of massive industrial sort of base that is already installed. And, you know, however, you know, how is it, you know, it has to kind of make inroads against that, uh, which has been around for like, about, you know, I don't know, years. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, if there's no more questions in the audience, then maybe... We move on to the next demonstration.
which thank you Thanks. <laughs>